Um, and thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you so much for asking me to come and speak here today. I really, um, I really appreciate that. Uh, doo -doo. There we go. Hello. How are you all doing today? Are you all good? So, back in 2015, the content team at the Financial Times was struggling. We had some problems with the stability of our content platform, and what that meant was our developers were constantly firefighting. Stress levels were rising and team morale was dropping. How did we get into that situation and how did we manage to turn it around with the help of iQuest? So we often give technical talks as though we set out on a journey. We often set out to reach a goal, facing some difficulties along the way, but we reach our destination at the end and everything works out well. But I don't actually think that that's really true. I think that's often because we're looking back at it with hindsight afterwards. In reality, what's probably happened is that we've heard there's a great place to travel to, and we've heard that it's paved with gold, but we're not exactly sure how to get there. It's just in this direction somewhere. And often, we're not actually setting out from home either. We've actually got other things behind us that are weighing us down. Even on a brand new project, we only get to do new things with no decisions being made behind us at the very start. And some of those decisions can come back and cause problems for us later on. So I'm a senior integration engineer at the Financial Times. I started off in desktop support, um, became a Linux sysadmin for some time, and now I work in the DevOps space. Currently, I lead a team in the content platform who are responsible for the back-end content APIs and microservices that we run. Although we are most well-known as a newspaper, we're actually a digital content company these days. And last year was the first time that digital subscriptions overtook the print newspaper and our advertising as well. Our content and our website are absolutely critical to our survival. We invest heavily into technology and we have plenty of teams working across the business in different areas. What that means is we're big believers in DevOps practices and cultures. And we invest and trust our teams to make the correct decisions around technology, architecture, and delivery. As an extension of that as well, what that means is our teams are responsible for their products and their services from the very beginning of the product lifecycle to supporting it in production and to the end as well. iQuest have been a key part of our digital transformation journey over the last 10 years. We've been partnered with them very closely. In fact, roughly half of the developers and engineers on the content platform are from iQuest. Their, their technical knowledge and their domain infrastructure has been absolutely critical to many of the improvements and changes that we've made over the, on the way. Our content platform itself is made up of Java and Go microservices, which are running in Docker containers. And we're cloud first where possible as well. So all of this runs in Amazon Web Services. A high level view looks something like this. What we do is we take content from multiple systems, transform it into a common format. We then use natural language processing to annotate these articles and content with concepts and ideas. And then we load in information about the millions of these concepts that we use in that process as well. Finally, we then make all of this available to our clients, both internally and externally, done by back-end APIs. But in practice, what it actually looks like is something more like this, which I'm not actually expecting you to be able to see any detail. This is only half of our infrastructure diagram, so that gives you an idea of just how complex this can all be. Because we use a microservice architecture, our system is made up of around 150 microservices, all with a single responsibility. We need resilience and availability as well, which means that we need multiple copies of the same service running on different underlying hardware in the event of a failure. For us, that in practice means around 600 containers running on a much smaller number of Amazon instances. This is where cluster orchestrators come into play for us because it's impossible to manage this number of services manually. What we need is we need automated deployment, we need scaling, and we need management of our containerized applications to help us. We started running Docker applications back around 2015 in production, and at the time, there were several competing products that we could have used. 
The problem was, though, that to build all of these into a coherent platform that we could use and fit our needs would have been extremely complicated. What this meant was that we ended up building a cluster orchestrator system ourselves, in-house. Simon Wardley is an IT strategist, and he did an excellent talk this year at KubeCon. He talks about how successful technology goes through a maturity curve, because it starts off as something for experts, it becomes more common, turns into a product that you can buy, and then eventually becomes a commodity. For example, the evolution of the cloud. While it started off as a complicated system, these days computing can be bought as a commodity. There's another great blog post as well by Dan McKinley from Etsy on their engineering team, and he talks about the idea of innovation tokens as a way to measure sort of like your software innovation. What that means is any new technology that you decide to use or innovate on uses one of these tokens, and you've only got a limited supply to spend. So using a brand new database technology, that's one token. If you decide to use a new programming language, that's another token. So building a platform from scratch is definitely quite a few tokens. So why did we choose to do that? Well, for us, containerization offered some big advantages compared to our old systems. Before we had introduced containers, we were running each service on its own instance, which is a really inefficient use of resources. Not, microservices don't tend to use a lot of CPU or memory, which means there's a lot of extra cost that you're paying for no benefit. After we introduced containers, we could easily run lots of services on a single instance, and we ended up running, I think, our entire production platform on a handful of instances, cross-region, around the world, instead of what would have been several hundred small VMs instead. And this reduced our costs significantly, so the uh, accounting department were very happy with us there. Before, as well, we had to provision infrastructure for each service to give us staging environments and to provide cross-region resilience. On our new containerized platform, though, we didn't have to do that. All we had to do was build a single service file and then merge a pull request in GitHub, and that was it. This was much, more, much quicker and less error-prone, and that meant we could experiment a lot more of our services as well. Those were all some great benefits, but the gains that we did get were offset by some other things, though. Because we built the platform ourselves, we had nowhere to go when something went wrong and we needed help. We had to fix it ourselves. And documentation of decisions that were made and sort of like changes that were chosen along the way wasn't always a high priority. So, in our case, most of the containerization work itself was done by a small group of developers and engineers. And what happened was the key members of that group all moved on from the FT over the course of a few months, which left us with a huge knowledge gap on our platform. And when that happened, we ended up supporting something in production that we didn't completely understand. The flip side of innovation tokens is that most of the time, we should try to choose boring technology. And boring isn't a bad thing. Boring technologies are well understood and easily supportable. You want to innovate on the things that differentiate your company from your competitors. But the platform on which you run those things, you want that to be as boring as possible. Because when we started using containers, we didn't have a boring alternative to building our own platform. But Towards the end of 2016, there were people successfully running off-the-shelf cluster orchestrators in production. And things were moving from custom-built to product and even towards commodity by this point. We had to take advantage of those moves because once something is available as a product, we don't want to be building that ourselves unless it is absolutely critical to our business. The FT is not a cluster orchestration company. And we're a digital news organization, so that's where we want to focus our innovation whenever possible. We ran a workshop for a few days to evaluate what options we had, and we agreed upon two metrics in this workshop. The first one was to reduce the amount of time spent supporting our systems in production, because when things went wrong in the internals of our stack, it was often hard to diagnose the problem and to fix it. And worse, there was no one that we could then escalate to. And the second metric is amusing, but totally serious. Because you remember that I mentioned that team morale had dropped very low, 
And one of the ways in which developers were venting their frustration was by making sarcastic jokes about how moving to a new platform would solve all of our production problems. We were all really fed up with the number of production incidents that we were having, and worse, people from other parts of the business as well were starting to comment on how flaky our systems were. After a few days of evaluating our options, we picked Kubernetes, and the reason for that is because we preferred it to the alternatives that we assessed. It fit our requirements that we needed, and we also liked that multiple cloud providers were starting to support Kubernetes as well. We were hoping it would become an emerging standard. Back in 2017, I think, Liz Rice ran this poll, and it looked like people were successfully using Kubernetes in production, and we'd be able to learn from their experiences. The later announcement of the Elastic Kubernetes service by Amazon was a nice confirmation that we were definitely thinking along the right lines. And today, at the end of 2018, all of the main cloud providers have a managed Kubernetes solution, so I think the ecosystem looks very healthy right now. At the FT, we often work at the cutting edge of technology, and there's a lot of benefits to this. For example, our move to microservices and continuous deployment somewhere around five years ago, and what that meant was it meant we leapt from 12 releases per year, so one a month, to over 2,000 per year. And that lets us experiment and change and move quickly. But sometimes, being at the leading edge means that you need to change because you tried something out and it didn't work out so well. Or maybe that area that you innovated in has now matured and you can buy something in to give you the same benefits. This will happen some of the time, and that's perfectly okay. But you need to be prepared to move when it does. Even though we had good reasons to do this migration, it was still a major challenge because we don't really want to switch our horses midstream. We've got a lot of other projects going on at the same time. In our case, we had lots of services in production and under active development, probably around 150. Prior to that migration, we had five other teams delivering new functionality at the same time as well, and all of that work had complicated interdependencies. Again, I'm not expecting you to see the detail here, but this is a map between the different work streams that we had in 2017. It's actually only a third of the full diagram, so you can understand that this is all extremely complicated, and our migration team had to make sure that they didn't impact on any of this planned work. If we'd been starting from scratch, we would have built the platform and then moved across a handful of services at a time. However, we had to know that Kubernetes could support our complicated routing and failover logic, and what that meant was that we had to migrate a large percentage of our services all at the same time just to be able to build confidence. This all took time, which meant that we ran our old and our new platforms in parallel for quite a while. We also had to be careful as well that our other developers could continue to work normally during this process. because. If we'd made a change that had just added maybe 10 minutes, say, to our deployments, when you have 2,000 releases, that works out to 47 working days. So we, couldn't make, we had to make sure we didn't impact that at all. What was actually involved in the migration process, though? So the first step for us was to replace our old service descriptor files with Helm charts, which is a service package manager for Kubernetes. Those files were pretty standard between our microservices, so that didn't take too long. And the second step as well was to integrate the service into our new build and deployment pipeline. So again, this was quite heavily templated, so the changes per service weren't particularly big. And that sounds great, there's two small changes to make. They don't sound particularly difficult. But while you haven't got large changes per service, when you have 150 of those services to change, it adds up. And I think it worked out to roughly around 10 working days if it was just a half hour change per service. And in reality, of course, it took a lot longer than 30 minutes to make those changes, build, deploy, test in parallel. There were several reasons for this. Some of our microservices had been working happily unchanged for years, and that meant when we did need to change them, we were hit with unexpected problems, with packages being updated and changing, and suddenly the builds were broken. We had to fix that up and make sure that that couldn't happen again in future. Other teams at the FT do nightly service builds, which I think is a great idea, because it means that you pick up any problems that come as they come, 
You don't want to be sat there trying to fix your build process in order to get an emergency bug fix or security fix out into production. We also came across services where health checks or good-to-go endpoints hadn't been set up correctly. And while we never noticed this before, Kubernetes relies upon these. What that means is, without these working correctly, we couldn't get all the benefits from our new container platform. So we had to make changes around that as well. And on a similar, lo similar note, some of our older services expected everything to be perfect when they started up. And as I'm sure some of you are aware, that's not always the case. What we had to do was make sure that our services could cope with being restarted and moved around and migrated from machine to machine. And finally as well, we are all engineers at heart, I think. So when we started working on these services that hadn't been looked at for a while, it was really tempting to start making all the other small changes and improvements to fix up small problems that we could see in the code. That can really spiral out of control and take much longer than you're expecting. So in total, I think each service migration took much, much more than 30 minutes. We had to get every developer across all of our teams involved to swarm the work and focus on migrating these services. This was because we needed everyone on the team to understand the new platform, and we didn't want the people dedicated to the Kubernetes migration to be doing the same repetitive tasks months on end. It was slow going, but it did get us good feedback from everyone, and it helped them to understand the new tools that they would be using. This definitely had an impact on the work that the other teams were doing, but we were able to speak to our product manager and explain the necessity of what we were doing here. With hindsight, if we were to do things differently, the single biggest change that we would make is to get everyone swarmed onto the work early and often, not just for a few days. We paid a price for the size of the migration team, which was small because we hadn't got the funding for the project as much as we'd wanted. In addition to this, running in parallel for several months means that it brought its own challenges with it. The longer that we ran, the longer we had to release code between two stacks and then test it against two stacks. It increased our monthly AWS bills, which was fine for a short duration, but we had to make sure that we communicated that to senior management Otherwise, we would have had some very awkward questions. And our cost could have been even higher if we hadn't turned off some parts of our old platform in order to save money. Well, it wasn't just our runtime costs as well. We were running load and soak tests against both platforms, which generated a lot of logs. All of those got sent to our log aggregator, and we actually blew out our license agreement a couple of times, which didn't make us very popular across the business. Alice Goldfuss did a great talk at the Lead Dev London conference this year called the Container Operator's Manual. It covers a lot of the things that we wish that we had known before embarking on this project. And it talks about the extra problems and considerations that most people won't realize. If your company is considering running containers in production, I would personally say that this is a must-watch talk. Because in total, for us, the migration to Kubernetes took just over an entire year. And from speaking to other companies who have gone, undergone similar projects, this is entirely normal. However, our original estimates for this were far lower than that. And what that meant was we hadn't planned around a lot of the additional work that we uncovered as we went. This is probably the one piece of advice that I would give to anyone considering implementing Kubernetes in production. It will take time. It will take investment, and it requires a dedicated team. I have a huge amount of respect for the two iQuest engineers who were fully committed to the Kubernetes migration project, because it was really tough on them. Without their dedication to the project, none of this would be possible, so I'm very, very grateful to them for this. Finally, though, our goal was in sight. We'd switched over just before a key part of our old platform became end of life, and the last few months were intense, but we did make it. The actual migration went very smoothly. We flipped across a DNS switch to point traffic at our new clusters. And while we found a couple of small issues where we'd fixed bugs that our customers were relying on, it all worked out in the end, and we fixed those issues really quickly. So did we get the results that we were looking for? We think so. Because we now have a considerably more stable platform. In the month following Kubernetes Go Live, we had three production incidents compared to 17 in the same time period in 2017. And we've had far less out-of-hours call-outs and support incidents, so 
Sometimes Kubernetes has actually recovered our platform before we've even logged on to our laptops. Since we have less incidents, we no longer have sarcastic comments in Slack about the stability of our platform either, and that was a success as well. We now use a technology that we can Google about. We can watch talks, discuss our problems with other companies. We can send people on training. And yes, we managed to reduce our costs as well. Compared to our old containerized stack, we had another 35% reduction in our AWS costs. Even with the cost of migration, we think that we will break even in about three years compared to our old stack. So that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover today, and I hope that you've all found it interesting and useful. Because that was our journey. We didn't start necessarily from the easiest place, and we didn't necessarily actually end where we were expecting either, but that's okay. Because we need to remember to keep asking ourselves, is this an okay place to stop, or do we need to keep going a bit further? We learned a lot along the way, and we now have a stable platform, happier developers, and they can spend their time focusing on new functionality and innovation rather than supporting the platform. Before I finish, I'd like to credit Sarah Wells as well, who's a technical director at Financial Times. So while she wasn't able to come along today for this event, this talk has been heavily based upon her KubeCon keynote this year, so I definitely recommend checking it out if you have the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeroen. Oh, and we have questions? Again, thank you for yep. uh, sharing with us this experience. Um, if there are any questions, we still have some time, so... Mm -hmm. I will be um, around most of the day as well. Yes, so if anyone would like to come well. and chat, you are more than welcome to. So. Okay. So, if there are no questions... Oh, oh got one there's the a question back. Hello. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm not that good of a thrower, <laughs> so I bring it to you. I'd be worried about knocking the camera over myself, I think. I'm, I'm oh. Hi. Uh, can you tell me, please, because you told us that uh, one of your main values uh, for, the, for this solution was high availability of the solution. Did you ever consider to take a look also in the Microsoft technologies in order to have at least as a backup in the first uh, start, let's say, as a backup solution, the Microsoft technology, Azure, for example? Um, so the question is, because we need high availability, have we considered yes. other technologies? Yes, just to have multiple vendors, because we saw that you have Amazon services over there. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Did yeah. you ever consider also to try Microsoft? Um, so across the FT, we are quite heavily uh, involved with Amazon, and we have a preferential rate with them. So we tend to not try to mix too many cloud providers. Um, I think when we had originally started our move to the cloud, and that was about four or five years ago, this wasn't part of our project, but a FT-wide um, push, um, we evaluated a few options, and I think we went with Amazon. Um, I don't think we're looking at choosing other cloud platforms to try and run our systems on, because that adds a lot of complexity, um, and we're not sure we need that extra benefit at the moment. I hope that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Kind of, quite, yes. Not quite. I, I may have misunderstood it. Um, so you should be aware that the digital transformation makes us to, uh, let's say, assess very often the progress of the technology because four years ago the technology was in a kind, now the yep. technologies are completely different. And maybe it oh, was yeah, for absolutely. you to assess it regularly, let's say. Yep. Just to have a clear view on the problem. Oh, absolutely. Of so, uh, Thank you so much. I, I think the scale of migrating the FT to another cloud platform would be have to offer some really significant benefits for the amount of cost that would cost, ta uh, cost us, if that makes sense. We are, we are always evaluating our options. But I'm not speaking about cost right now. I'm speaking about features and benefits for your business. Yes, but okay? from my point of view, I still need to worry about cost. Thank you very much for your question. So, any other qu I'll come and chat to you later. I think I may have misunderstood your point. So. Cheers. Um, anyone else?